times of the sermon is authentic worship. One of the things that 2020 has taught me since the big shutdown is that I don't know what I should know about worship. You might say, well, Brother Bobby, you lead worship. Yeah, and I can tell you when we worship, and I can tell you sometimes when we gather together. But those are not the two identical things there. It's not the same thing. And I, I hope what I'm learning through this, and I hope to convey this to you when we're talking about authentic worship, is the, uh, I mean, in um, a lot of times I'll, um, I'll write some words down and call it a sermon, and, and I'll give it a title, and I wish I had given it another title, and that's what I've done this morning. Uh, do you know worship is by invitation only? It really is. Always has been that way. By invitation from us as believers to another believer, okay, but not really. It's by invitation from God himself. That's what worship is all about, when God invites us. And I knew when I was getting this sermon ready and developed that God was going to uh, send visitors our way this morning. You know why? Because that's just how God works. And I don't know if anybody invited them. Why would they show up on a COVID Sunday at a church? They may not know a lot of the people around about them. Why would an individual come to church? Because in these times like we're living in today, there are people still looking and searching for God Almighty. Now you may not be, and I may not be even as a pastor, but I'm really interested in those people who will brave the elements like the hot, hot song, things like that, and have to put on a mask. Don't you know you could be sitting around the house and not have a mask on this morning, but you decided to come to worship. And, and I want to share some things that I'm learning through this event that uh, God has uh, caused to come our way. In John chapter 4, verse 19, it reads, The woman said unto him, Sir, I believe, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she began her religious thought there. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that it's in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. But Jesus said unto her, listen to verse 21, it says, Woman, believe me, the hour comes and cometh when you shall neither worship in this mountain, talking about Gerizim, where the, the Samaritans worship, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. He goes on to say, you worship, you know not what. Now, I cannot believe Jesus said that except that he knew what he was talking about and he was the Son of God. That is not the way to make disciples when you look at somebody and you say, now when's the last time you said this to somebody? You have no idea who you worship. But that's what Jesus is saying here. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. This should have turned this woman completely around and said, I want nothing to do with you, but she's lingering just a little bit longer. And she hears him say, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. I've got in my Bible, by verse 23, it says, by invitation only. God is a spirit, he says in verse 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. She had heard some things about a Jewish Messiah coming, and she knew that just as soon as that Messiah got there, that he would make things different, and that he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I am I that speak unto thee, am he. 
just a few short minutes on these verses here. God has the authority to do to look down from Almighty Heaven. Sovereign Lord has the authority to look down and to set the standard for authentic worship. He's the only one that has the, has the privilege to do that, has the prerogative to do that, but he does. And as believers, we have the privilege of searching his word for what worship really means. You have a Bible. You have the scriptures there. You can look in detail and begin to see whether, whether Bobby's on the right track here or not because this is not the only sermon that you're going to hear about genuine worship because I understand, I realize that we fall short and don't always achieve this fellowship with God and with one another. Is there not a better definition of worship than that? Fellowship with God and with one another. Brother Bobby, things are difficult this day and time. Well, they always have been. Before COVID, we always had these issues with one another, right? And we quit coming to church because we didn't like what somebody said about us years ago. And the idea is for us to get over it. Because haven't we spoken evil against other people? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm not asking for an amen now. I just want you to sit and to listen and everything and to realize that we fall short. And when we do this, fellowship with God and one another. But it's our Christian duty to guard this spiritual experience. I've used all these things, but ultimately I, 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 I want to center in on what true worship really is so as not to lose it when we begin to experience it again. And we will, and we can do that even today. That is, if we recognize who God is. You see, I want you to look at the beginning of this religious conversation. But before, before I say that, I want to give you just a couple of um, homespun illustrations as to what true worship really is. Here, here's number one on the list here. You ready for this now? I got this this past week. Worship is crawling around in the flower bed, <laughs> cleaning up some of the things that uh, have grown besides flowers, weeds. Worship is cleaning up the flower bed and getting into a bunch of ants. Because worship is supposed to sting you every once in a while. Y'all with me on that? I mean, it really is. Worship is supposed to cause a bruise every once in a while. It's supposed to prick your heart every once in a while. And if this pastor doesn't say something that would prick your heart every once in a while, I'm not talking about taking you out on the stretcher. But like an ant, when an ant gets a hold of you, let me give you a good illustration. You see, I got my watch on. It's on the wrong side of me. I'm not checking to see what time it is, but I just did. <laughs> but I got my watch on my right hand. You know why? Because I got ant bites on this one here. And that's what worship is. You see, if God doesn't prick your heart somewhere in the message here somewhere and show you some things that you need to do to improve your, your uh, religious uh, standard that... Uh, well, his religious standard in your life. See, you didn't worship. If you can look back on things that are happening in, in, in your life, the good things and the bad things, and blame, I always blame it on somebody else, guess what? But when you sit down and you let a pastor talk to you, or you let the Holy Spirit of God, which is much better than a pastor, talk to you, you begin to see God will, in a worship experience, he will prick your heart. Not your arm, but see, worship is a doing, minding your own business. And all of a sudden, somebody made you and encouraged you to come to church. You're here just to please somebody. And then all of a sudden, Brother Bobby is already, not Brother Bobby, but the Holy Spirit of God has already pricked your heart. Let me give you another illustration. Where worship is my brother-in-law's David. His German police dog that never did like Brother Bobby. His name was Roscoe. He never did like me. He didn't. Let me tell you why. And then Miss Charlotte, we rode in to visit Mama. And I think Dad was already passed away by then. We rode in to visit Mama on their kingdom 
their kingdom that God allowed them to build. My brother-in-law, Jerry and Betty, all the grandkids is out there playing like nobody's business. I jumped out of the car and I started running toward those kids because I wanted to play with them too. I didn't know Roscoe was in town. <laughs> David had brought Roscoe and Roscoe met me halfway <laughs> with his fangs barred. That's what worship is. I mean, it, it really is. And you know what you do when a dog comes at you and things like that and you're a preacher, you just yell at him. But he kept coming. So I fed him one side of my tennis shoe. I kicked that dog. A good kick. I was proud of myself. He come back for more. And I didn't have any more, so I just yelled at him again. But see, that's what worship is. In the midst of everything that's going on, God will prick our heart. And, and all of a sudden, we begin to see worship is happening because God is speaking to us. I don't know what he's doing on this side over here. And I don't know what he's doing on this side over here. But God is speaking to us. And that's when you truly experience the living God working in your life. Oh, by the way, later on, that dog finally left me alone. But I found myself out there playing with the kids on the trampoline. And Roscoe saw me again. You know what he did? He started growling, he started barking, and he come at me again. But I was on track of him, playing with the kids. But every time I'd hit that trampoline to jump back up, I could feel his teeth trying to get underneath there. That's what worship is. God is always trying to get our attention, always trying to move us into a a, a holy attitude of prayer and the worship. And that's what's happening even, even here. So whatever you do when you come to church, do not expect, if it's true worship, do not expect to leave without a few scars on you. Because you've just walked into the presence of a holy God. Same as with this woman here. I want you to listen to the beginning of this religious conversation. Now, I really do love them. I mean, I, I live to have another religious conversation. It doesn't matter who it's with or whatever, but it just so happened that this religious conversation was between a Jew and a Samaritan. They have no dealings with one another. Uh, church history tells us that. Their own history tells us that. They hate one another. The only thing worse than a uh, Samaritan uh, for a G would be a Gentile, and, and and we feel that bill also, right? I mean, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they would look at us and they'd say, "You have stolen Jesus, our Messiah." No, they would look at us and say, "Salvation has been offered not only to the Jews but for the Gentiles also." But I'm getting ahead of myself in this worship experience here. But this Jew and this Samaritan, neither was of the or, were of the ordinary garden variety. This Jewish man was God in the flesh. If somehow or another in all of your intelligent learning and all of your schooling, if you can erase that out of your mind, I would say erase it. But then, if you can't erase that from Jesus, is God in the flesh. He was born a Jewish man. Let me share this with you. There's um, insurance. Oh. Commercial. That I see quite frequently when I'm watching too much TV. And they're not inviting me to be a part of some kind of Medicare plan again. But I, I've, and, but, and it's very subtle. But I can see Satan dealing, doing it. But listen to this. You know what it tells you? Hmm. This insurance plan is a very subtle message, but it's still a message. Whatever you do, you don't want to grow up and be like your mom and dad. Isn't that true? If you're not careful, you're going to grow up and be just like your mom and dad. Well, if they taught you right, if they applied the Board of Education where it should have been at a young age enough, what's wrong with being like your mom and dad when you're being raised? 
But see, now that's what the public society is telling us today. You don't want to be like your mom and dad. Were they that bad to make you come to church? Were they that bad to the point that um, you, you thought church was an awful, terrible place to be? The bottom line is this. As this woman comes into this position to where she sees Jesus, God's son. And I will just identify him this morning as Jesus, the law keeper. <laughs> because he perfectly kept the book of the law that was delivered to Moses. Jesus, the law. Now the Jewish people wouldn't agree with that. How many times did he break the Pharisee Pharisaical rules there on the Sabbath and things like that. But I want to tell you that Jesus was the law keeper. Let me tell you why I really believe that true worship, no matter where it comes from, what preacher's preaching, shouldn't sting you every once in a while. Shouldn't get under your skin every once in a while. And I'm not doing my job as, as a pastor if, if I don't explain the word of God with you to the point that you can understand it should, it, it should sink its teeth deep into us when the word of God is being preached. It should cause us uh, pain like an ant bite. You know, them, them rascals can hurt. So can the word of God. Please kick this out of your mind, okay? God is not a furry mascot that you can lead around and tell him to do whatever you want him to do. Are y'all with me on Amen. that? Amen. God is not just a good thought every once in a while. He's a stickler. You think sometimes when you're talking to God, you got into a rose, uh, a, a bed of roses and stuff, and there's ants there. No, because God is always trying to get our attention. And here's the reason why, okay? And, and I can go into this in further detail if you want me, want me to later on. But uh, for sake of time and for the sake of the message here, all the Ten Commandments. Are, are you with me? This is a stickler point right here, okay? All of the Ten Commandments can be broken while sitting comfortably in a church pew. <laughs> that sticks, doesn't it? I mean, that's a prick right there. I mean, I mean really, that, that's, by the bottom, that's hardcore preaching. Every one of the Ten Commandments can be broken while we're sitting here in a worship service, just sitting in the pew. Brother Bobby, I don't believe that. Well, if you want me to, I, I, I'll even let you decide what message you want me to preach tonight. I'll share in more detail there. I don't have time to go in it now. But the bottom line is, here is Jesus, the law keeper. And will always be the keeper to the point that, that he dies a sinless life there. He gives his life so we can be also forgiven of our sins. You're telling me, Brother Bobby, all we got to do is come to church to sing it? No. All I'm telling you is this. This is where we come to realize that that's not a thing that we can do. When, when we're sitting and we're listening to Bible study, our mind might be a thousand miles away. Did you bring your phone with you this morning? Uh, I, I, I would encourage you to, you know, I really believe if God's pricking me and they're kicking me like this, I, I really need to listen and see what he has to say. This Samaritan woman, she was the lowest of the law. Jesus finds the time for her. He always will. Their dialogue moved in the direction of worship. As believers, we need to do what we do best. We bring to God an offering in worship. Always do. We bring to God an offering. It is in worship that we sense a need to dedicate something to God. To make right an attitude or a problem that we're having with our family members or with our friends. It is an opportunity to make things right. And everything we offer to God becomes His and is marked by His holiness. I had no intentions, Brother Bobby, of bringing an offering this morning. I'm not talking about something put in the offering plate. I'm talking about yourself. Paul told the Roman believers in Romans chapter 12, present your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord, to God. Is this your reasonable service? 
You see, without true worship, our tendency is to go back to the old lifestyle characterized by sin. Let me put it to you this way. It is a guaranteed fact. If you don't experience worship, every chance that you get, you will go back to the old lifestyle. Brother Bobby, what was wrong with my old lifestyle? Well, it was riddled with sin and you couldn't stop yourself. Now you can, but you've got to be in sync with God and true worship. Or nothing ever changes. You see, not only do we see this beginning of a religious conversation, we see the end of a religious observance of worship. You see, God stopped the worship practice at Mount Gerizim. If you want some more information on that, it's very interesting. It really is. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 28 through 33, this is why Jesus was, he, he was so tough and, and sticking hurting this, actually this woman and, and, and even all of her kinfolks there. This was the reason he was being serious with her because he knew what they used to do. In the Old Testament scriptures tell us there in 2 Kings and it tells us in chapter 17 that when the Assyrian army came in and, and destroyed the, the ten lost tribes there of Israel, and there was only the tribe of Judah and Benjamin left, that the king of Assyria brought in all these other people groups and they put them there where Israel used to live, in the promised land. You know what happened? The Bible says that lions, you know, the kind with fangs, not on a sheet of paper, but said that lions out of the forest would come through and kill the residents there. So they got this idea, this here, we don't know how to worship the God of this land here. So they got a priest to come back that was in exile. They got a priest to come back and to teach them what it meant to worship a true God. And so they brought this priest back. He told them what it meant to observe and what to do to offer offerings to the Lord God. And then, you know, here's what they added to it, though. In, in these verses here in 2 Kings, there were five, six maybe seven different gods that they decided they would worship God, but they'd have all these other gods too. And they began to worship like that, just adding God to the mix. Can I tell you that you can't do that with God? You can't do that. You can try to, but you can't. You can't hold on to the world with one arm and hold on to the worship of God with another arm. You can't do that. You cannot love God and money too. Jesus said you will love one and hate the other. I wish there was a medium ground there, but there was no medium ground there. Jesus tells this woman, because of the worship practice that was stopped there at Mount Gerizim, and even at Jerusalem in 70 AD, because he told her, in, in no way will we continue worshiping the way we worship now, even in Jerusalem, because in 70 AD, the Roman uh, government came in, destroyed Jerusalem and, and the temple there also. Things are going to change, says Jesus. Verse 21, he says, The hour coming, it was a promise of God that he fulfilled. Verse 22 says, Jesus told her she didn't know what she worshipped. Salvation is of the Jews, but it still didn't turn her away. She was still listening. And then Jesus shared with her that God is a spirit. He sees those who will worship him in spirit and truth. That's the reason for the invitation only. It's by invitation only that we're, any of us are sitting here and having our hearts pricked or having our hearts reminded of the goodness of God because even inside of a worship center, we can break all ten of the commandments there. Brother Bobby, that sounds impossible. I'm not doing anything. Is not our mind always at work? Is what I'm saying rolling off of you like water on a duck's back? Are you understanding a little bit of what worship truly is? 
Here's the sermon. Our bodies are God's temple. The worship place of the living God. God is seeking true worshipers. It's by his invitation only. Now this is directly for us. This morning, and I'm glad you are here. I, I really am. Oh, I hope I hadn't been too sticky, too pointed, too pointed. But it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So, have you noticed the fast rate of change our worship style is going toward? Have you noticed that? Oh, what are you talking about, Brother Marvin? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Have you noticed how fast we're moving? Uh, and I'm not sure we're moving toward God. I, I, I'm convinced we're moving away from God. And I think God is trying to get our attention. You know how we used to do offerings? We don't do offerings anymore that way, do we? Have an usher come by, pass a plate there, and we give our offering and stuff. You see, this giving back to God, he calls us all to participate in. This giving is to remind us that we're only caretakers and we don't like that thought whatsoever. Because right, buddying up beside caretaker is the word sharecropper. I should know my granddaddy was one on both sides of the family. And we like to think we own this stuff because we have our name on it. You meet God before next Sunday morning and find out how much stuff you own. That's a little prick, and you know? that's, that's a little being there. But I'm just encouraging you to get your, your heart right with it. Have you noticed how often it's changing? We don't pass the plate around anymore. You know what it does? Just, just when you and me, it kind of makes it easier for us to rob God. Nobody knows whether we're robbing him or not. Isn't there something in one of the commandments that says, Thou shalt not steal? It kind of makes it easier for us to rob. Brother Bob, I want to tell you something. Our church doesn't need your money. I mean, um, our church doesn't need my money. That's not what God said. That, that is not what God said. Did you know I don't usually do tithing sermons? This one just slipped out, I guess, I would say. It's very easy. It's very easy when, when we're not attending worship to forget about offering God anything. It's very easy, though, for us to... It, but, but it's hard. It's difficult for us to understand, though. What he really wants is your heart. And the more you stay away from that offering plate, the more you... Uh, the less you are reminded of the importance. Really, what he really wants is your heart. He doesn't want your money. God doesn't need your money. He just wants you to recognize that he's in charge of everything. Do you know, talking about how things are changing for us, spiritual, spiritually speaking, in, in worship, you know what they tell us? They tell us sin spreads germs. Back off on your singing, Brother Jack. Just sing one, one first verse and last verse. That's what they tell us. Right? Folks, I am not making this stuff up. I could not make this stuff up. They tell us. And if we did have a choir, we would supposed to be closing down the choir. Amen? I mean, I'm telling you, the worship is in the process of changing here. So ultimately, what we're hearing is stop the singing. Cancel the choir. That's between you and me. Could this be the work of God? For the last 30 years, we worshipers have been telling God what kind of music we will put up with and what kind we want. Well, that's another little cut, isn't it? But is it not true? I like this. You don't sing them songs the way I used to sing them. I am not coming back. Uh, forgive me for offending people. I may not have said that in just the right manner and things like that. But I just, now if I can understand the song and realize it's bringing glory to God, okay. If I can't, I'm going to slip out of there. Because I want genuine worship. But I am not one to dictate what kind.
when the music is played. You know who is? God is. He is. But I thought I had a right to say something. This is Christ's church. He died on the cross for it. It's by his forgiveness that we are his, his keeping the law that we're saved. This is not the pastor's church. The pastor has no authority whatsoever except to preach to you the word of God, to prick your heart so a little bit every once in a while. Could it be that God said, well, I'll just stop all of them. I'll just stop all of them except the one that brings glory. Pray. Let me say this with all the love that I can. If your God won't let you sing, if your God won't let you pray, then you need to find you another God. It is not the God of the scriptures. I have seen on more than one occasion my dad be in the depth of, of pain from pneumonia and things like that. And he'd take his guitar and he would sing his way back to hell. Pray. Any altar time is a thing of the past. You did not expect coming here this morning for me to give you an invitation, did you? For, uh, an invitation for you to come. You see how worship is changing? You, you see, I believe God is all into this. I really do. Because the bottom line is, if you want to come to the altar and pray, there's nobody on this God's green earth that will stop you from making that trip to the altar and pray. You know, say, Brother Bobby, I can pray where I want to. Yeah, I know. But do you? But do you? After God has touched your heart, do you? And there's something about humbling ourselves that we just refuse to do when it comes to bending the knee. Bending the knee. It's so humiliating. I mean, it really is. But guess what? It's so rewarding, too. I've been in a church before where I didn't know half the people there had well over probably three, four hundred in attendance. And God touched my heart and said, go to the altar and pray. Christ said, they're not having an invitation. They're singing. And you want me to go to the altar and pray? I sure did feel a sense of relief though when I just wrenched my arms off of that pew and went.